Cool. Right, at the risk of being slightly boring, we need to pull out a few lessons because like every other run, there is stuff we learned today which will be relevant to how we conduct our business when we come back here to set a world land speed record. Um, so, comms, control, what happened to you? No idea. I was still had good comms with the Marshall Network, so I was still chatting to them. Um, yeah, on a different radio though. Yeah. Um, so, so you, you, Channel 1 just stopped working and just you... Stopped, I, no, so I think it was the radio handset itself. Okay. Um, so I switched out the radio when Stuart Gordon said we've not heard, we can't get through. So it's just handset, handset, guys. Yeah, handset, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it, it, it happens. But whoever uh, and, and whoever prompted uh, Eng to give a radio call, a telephone call, we were on the phone at the time. But very good. In fact, it was you guys, wasn't it? Yeah. But good call. Um, call signs. Um, keep working on using your call sign as well as uh, all the other information. Rescue one. Not mentioning any names. Um, and in terms of who you are and what you are, um, if you've left the start team, you aren't start anymore, you are Milton or whoever. Um, it's a good example of, you know, if you're part of the Eng convoy, for instance, on the way out, and then you need to go and do something different, you need to use a different call sign. I know you know that, but for everybody else's benefit. Uh, cockpit, thank you very much for all the work in trying to keep the dust down. We aren't there yet, but it is getting better. Certainly in terms of the uh, use, you know, combination of using the Rain-X and, uh, and not wiping it um, any more than we absolutely had to when we got out there. Um, there was very little dust actually sticking to the, uh, uh, to the windscreen, which was brilliant. Interesting, we did actually get some moisture on the inside of the windscreen. Uh, Rupert, you're breathing too heavily on the way out. I, that's probably temperature changes overnight in here, but you know, it's, bizarrely, despite the fact we're in a desert, moisture is still an issue. And it's probably the Rain-X is actually now um, showing up the condensation and the moisture beads a lot more than it would. So we gave that a bit of a wipe, it was fine. Um, there is still dust in the cockpit, so when we get back and start stripping down the car, please do not wipe any dust away in the cockpit. We need to find out, if we can, where it's coming in, because it's still quite misty and foggy inside the cockpit, and I'm still getting um, the, uh, the, the dust gradually accumulating on my visor inside the cockpit. So we have still got a dust leak somewhere. Um, but it's it's manageable, but if we can get rid of the rest of the dust, that'd be even better. Start team, line up, how did that go? Because uh, for those, it was mentioned briefly, the guys were going to go across the track and turn the other way, so that as the R31, as we look at it down that end, the R31 diagonally, they were going to come in so they could get as much distance as possible, which turned out to be quite useful. And again. Uh, across the track, so it came a lot of that weight um, around the line zero realised that we were going to go too far onto yeah. the track, so we made the, the decision there and then to go round one more time. Yeah. Spot, spot on, exactly, exactly the right call, uh, and, and as I said at the time, if you need another go, take another go. The point is, learning how to do that, should we need even more distance next time. As it is, we don't, but yeah, good call. Um, you know, there's no pride in the, this didn't work first time, it's have a look, see, and then get it right next time, which was perfect. Uh, Mike Cable, for those of you who don't know, when I plugged into the car, having tested the kit in here, it worked perfectly, plugged it into the car and there was a crackly noise and then the microphone stopped working and it turned out to be a broken cable actually in the microphone. And because Limo connectors are 600 quid a pop, we only had the one Limo and it was the wire that came out of the Limo that was the problem. So everybody gets their moment in the sun where the whole world is watching them and everything's waiting while it's in. It was Milton's today, so well done for getting that fixed quickly and effectively. Um, Red AST is a good source of spares, but possibly not much else. It wasn't even close to starting the jet engine today. You know, the, the, the jet needs to hit its, uh, its idle numbers. There's a camera running. It needs to hit its idle numbers, and we were about two-thirds of the way there. So it wasn't blowing anywhere close to hard enough, um, which means we need to rethink the, how we're going to use a spare AST if we blow up the, uh, the primary for next time. Um, and then into the run. A couple of things. I've mentioned to, uh, to some of you already, the, uh, you know, uh, all of the run worked perfectly up to uh, uh, throttling back and we were actually hitting the numbers, you'll see them in the video in a moment. The crossing the road, we normally hit the road at about 130 miles an hour, uh, despite the fact that with the angle we're actually closer to the road, we hit the road at 180 today and the causeway 500 miles an hour and still accelerating. Got to 600, more of which in a moment, and then throttled back. Um, there was a momentary pause and thought in my mind, um, partly, and having watched the video a few more times and looked at the data in more detail, I don't think I was correcting what I told you, I think I was just working faster than normal and anticipating all the things that could go wrong given we're getting close to limiting distance. The jet engine roll-off was 
marginally longer, but not massively longer. That is not where the extra speed came from. In order to make the speedo more robust, Joe has quite correctly blended uh, three different GPSs. The uh, jet which was working nicely, the blade which was working nicely, and the fin which was a bag of bolts. And as you'll see in the acceleration, the GPS was jumping around. And I saw that at about 300 miles an hour, and it actually jumped back 100 miles an hour and then corrects itself. So I'm now looking at the needle and the digital speedo and the backup digital speedo and comparing all three to see what the speed is, and it sorts itself out. What I didn't notice, approaching 600 miles an hour, about 560, the, uh, the, the needle jumped back to 540 and I keep using it. So when I lift the throttle, the, the speedo is indicating about 601 and I'm feeling really cocky about the, I've just pressed 600, actually doing about 620, but that's not what I'm seeing in the cockpit. So it's another point for, uh, uh, for the future, um, is that's one of the things that we're going to refine. But the fact is, I've got reliable speed in the cockpit, which we didn't have with the previous problem. So, Joe, thank you for that. We'll just squeeze down the error and, mar and the margin. And a couple of other minor things that came out of looking at that data just now. We are, um, we have over the whole of the uh, duration had 100% uh, successful shoots. They're not coming out quite like we were expected in terms of the sequencing, but they're working every single time. So unless we can find a good reason to, we're probably going to keep something pretty much like what we've got because it's working. It's now working so hard that at 590 miles an hour, when I bashed it out this time, the throttle actually bounces off the stop and wangs against the spring two or three times. So one of the things we need to do for next time is put a stronger spring on the throttle to actually stop it bouncing when the chutes come out, because we are now starting to work other bits of the car harder. Um, with the rest of the design, we also need to think about uh, longitudinal shock loading for anything else that may, may respond to that. Um, throttle is the obvious one, because I've just looked at it. OK, without further ado, Let's have a look at the run. I'm going to point at the speedo as we, as we go. Just pause there for a sec. When it gets up to, uh, uh, to round about here, you will actually see a big jump at the speedo. I'll point to that just before. And then I won't bother to point to the 560 because I had to show George twice. It's really, really difficult to see. Um, it took me about four goes before I noticed it. But you'll get an idea of the speed. So if I'm muttering about speed in the background, it's because I'm reading this and that and that one down there to try and triangulate the three. OK, let it play, please. So that's 250. Coming up through 300. 350, 250, 380. Five fifty, five forty, five sixty. Just pause there. The other thing I did, I didn't respond to the kilometre seven call. Stu and I discussed that beforehand because we'd seen a slight mismatch in, uh, in the data. We now know what that is. Um, so I then count two after the kilometre seven call because I know that was slightly too early if we're going to get the 600. So you heard me count two, three, and the speedo is now reading 601. And on the three, I lift. This is where the throttle comes off. Play, please. <laughs> And then pause there. Brakes at 250 only take it up to, uh, to 280, 290 centigrade. So we've still got a bit more in the brakes. Although they're not stopping the car very quickly, they can be used to absorb a fair chunk of energy. So it looks like steel brakes are good to go for, uh, for going faster. They are effective in shortening the rollout distance. If I've sounded defensive about the peak speed, that's not intentional. I'm just explaining why we need to work a little bit on the um, refining the, uh, the, the speed indications in the cockpit so that we can match them more closely to the predictions for land speed record braking because when we come back we're going to be going faster and we will need to know the speeds quite accurately so that we can make sure we stop every single time okay any questions on any of that let's have a look at the outside
very, very obvious rocking and twitching. There's gusts of crosswind coming in from the right-hand side. You can actually see the car responding there to crosswind. And that's a shootout and slowing down. <laughs> cool. Any other points, questions on the video or anything else for me today or at any time in the past? That is what you've achieved over the last four or five weeks and it's a hell of an achievement. Thank you for keeping me safe every single day while we've been doing that. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.